All right, we're going to get started. Hello and welcome to our webinar covering some advanced features in Blue Hill Universal software. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Nick Erickson, your host for this webinar. Today I'm joined by Dan Caesar and Meredith Bernstein, who will be co-presenting today's topic. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick moment to introduce today's presenters. Uh, starting with Meredith, she is one of our applications engineers within our low force static testing group. In this role, Meredith works closely with our customers to understand their application needs and figures out the best way to go about testing their materials, components, and products. Uh, moving over to Dan, he is the product manager for all of Instron's static testing software, which includes Blue Hill Universal. Um, before product management, Dan worked in the calibration lab and was also an applications engineer for a couple of years. Uh, we expect the presentation should take around 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions. I encourage you to submit any questions you might have here as we go along. Uh, some we might address uh, directly via chat and others we'll save for the end. And one last note, uh, I wanna mention in the top right hand corner of your screen, you should see the option to change your view. Uh, to really optimize the view of the slides and our presenters, we recommend you set your view to side-by-side -side speaker. And with that said, I'll turn things over to Dan to get us started. All right. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. Thanks again for, for taking the time to listen in today. And I really hope that uh, you can take away at least a, a few things uh, from this session to, to certainly make this worthwhile. So let's start with uh, just a simple agenda to outline exactly what you can expect from the next hour. Um, so we're going to begin with, with some slides where I will introduce the two advanced features that have been implemented into Blue Hill in the last couple of years. Um, I just wanna give you all a good understanding as to what exactly the AT2 and auto positioning are and why you may value them. And then also how we have integrated them into Blue Hill Universal. So once you have a good idea of what the products are, then you'll get a chance to see them in action with a live demo that Meredith will be conducting. And then, of course, as Nick had already mentioned, we're going to finish up with the Q&A session. So what is, what is the AT2? The, the AT2 is what Instron calls our automated XY stage that can be installed on any new or existing 6800 or 5900 series system. Um, so it's important to know it's, it's not its own type of Instron frame. It's, it's simply an accessory to be used with our standard Instron frames. And we, we call it the AT2 because it has two degrees of freedom. So that's the X and the Y degrees of freedom. Um, we also offer other advanced, uh, more advanced automation systems that have three degrees of freedom and six degrees of freedom to perform more tasks of the testing process, and we call them the AT3 and the AT6, respectively. Um, but really, in essence, the AT2 that we're gonna be looking at today is, is simply an, an automated XY stage that's installed on our standard Instron system. So here are uh, some of the supported test types. I mean, there really aren't any limitations on static axial testing. Um, that being said, typically, Compression tests are the most common, um, but if you do have the appropriate fixtures, that other testing modes are, are supported as well. And the, the unit under test, it, it can also uh, be almost anything, um, but we find that the most frequent applications are found in the biomedical and electronic industries. So life science companies manufacturing things like syringes and vials or, or drug capsules, they've recognized the value that an automated stage can bring to their testing process. Uh, and, and similarly, electronic manufacturers, they might have components and assemblies that really don't lend themselves to standard material testing where the, the unit under test is just simply pulled in tension or compressed. So they have uh, devices like keyboards and displays, buttons or switches, and all of these types of devices, they they must be tested just like other materials to understand how the end user or the end application is going to interact with that assembly. But just gripping these things and pulling them apart doesn't give you that information. Um, so 
it's it's really this uh, fixing it to a stage and then pressing on individual components allows them to gain, gain that knowledge, and that data. Um, and the, the value that an XY, then automated XY stage, uh, it really comes from a few different areas. The most obvious and the easiest to quantify is just the increase in the number of tests that you can run per day. So for instance, we've done uh, a number of studies that for say a biomedical lab, uh, testing syringes, maybe trying to understand the glide force uh, when a syringe is compressed, that in a manual system, uh, a, maybe a very, very seasoned operator can test 50 syringes in about 15 minutes. Um, but the same 50 syringes when you're using an XY stage uh, can take eight minutes. So approximately a 50% reduction. And this is because the, the time required to manually load and unload each specimen can add up quite quickly. Um, and when using the automated uh, XY stage, not only can that single system become more efficient, um, you can run more tests per day, but the, the operator can now spend this, this newly found time on other value add activities while the batch is just running by itself. So another benefit is, is reliability and consistency. Uh, and so it, it's near impossible to avoid variability uh, created by manually loading a specimen. So trying to repeat the very same gripping and positioning of a specimen after specimen after specimen is a challenge, especially in labs that have high throughputs and you really can't afford to spend time carefully installing these specimens. Also, you might have one oper operator that loads uh, specimens one way. You might have a second operator that, that has a slightly different technique of how to install the, the specimen. Um, and this creates variability. And the XY stage will eliminate this variability, which will directly increase the reliability uh, of the data that your system is producing. Um, and then, I mean, without the required operator interaction for, for each test, the system also just inherently becomes safer. And then, as, as mentioned before, many, many assemblies or components that they just can't be tested uh, with standard material testing fixtures. And if they can, they, they likely require the operator to, uh, to reposition the component to properly center that application of force. Um, and again, with, with an XY stage, there is no need to make these adjustments between tests. So Instron uh, has offered the AT2 for, for quite some time, uh, but its actual test control was kept separate from Blue Hill. And so that was until a couple of years ago. So today, uh, when you are preparing for a test, so if you're uh, trying to create a method uh, with, with an XY stage, it can all be done within, uh, within Blue Hill Universal. Uh, and so we have this new icon in system settings that if you click the icon, you're then presented up with this, this dialog box that has a number of different functions that allows you to move the stage around and to perform different actions to, to help you set up. Uh, and create methods as, as need be. So we're just gonna walk through some of these functions. So you can of course move the stage. Uh, so you can move it to a specified uh, X, Y position just by typing in that X and Y position and say move to position. Uh, you also can uh, simply press move to zero uh, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll send the stage back to that zero, zero position. Um, this is also where you'd be setting a, a, or defining a new zero location. By default, the stage is, is centered. Um, the zero zero is basically the stage is perfectly centered. But if you need, if you have a device where you want to define a new zero zero location, uh, you can do that. But at, at any given time, if you want to return that, that default zero location to center the stage, um, there's a simple button. Uh, that you can press. Uh, also, there's a, a stop button. So if, if the stage moving, the state, if the stage is moving and you have any need to just immediately stop that motion, you can do so. 
Um, and then you also see at the top that there are live displays showing your live X and your live Y uh, position. Uh, and this is very helpful when you're trying to develop a method and you need to, uh, you have, you're looking at a particular device that you need to uh, test um, to these say 10 or 15 different locations that you need to actually manually move the stage to capture exactly those positions uh, and then enter that into your method when you're setting it up. And so the actual setup itself, uh, we call uh, that you're building a, a test sequence. And so this is kind of our XY part of method creation where you're building a sequence. And we do this, you can do this in a, in a few different ways. We have a, a couple of different standard uh, grid types, uh, or sorry, sequence types. One is a grid and the other is a diamond. Um, but then if your component or the, your unit under test has, uh, doesn't lend itself to one of those standard uh, patterns, then you can move to a, a custom sequence. And here's just a list of other functions that I think are worth, are worth talking about. So you can see in the bottom right hand uh, part of the screen, the screenshot shows a, a live preview of the sequence that you're building. So it's not just that you're guessing and hoping this, the frame uh, will move, the stage will move where you expect it to go. You can, you can get a, a, a live preview as you're building your sequence. We also have the ability to convert sequences from standard to custom. And, and why you'd want to do that is maybe you have a, a device that maybe you have a device that has 90% of it is just a standard grid, but then there's just a few points that are that don't fit the pattern. So you can build that very quickly with a standard grid sequence, convert it to custom, modify those couple points, and then you're good to go. Then we have a, a an import export. Uh, capability again to save time. So say one method you spent 25, 30 minutes setting up the sequence to be perfect, but then uh, you you want to use that in a method that you create next week or a month later, that you can simply import that previously created sequence um, and you won't have to you don't have to recreate it. Another thing we've done in Blue Hill Universal is we've added a new test profiler step that's called move stage. So test profiler is a, is a certain type of test method that um, our, some of our customers use to build multi-step uh, tests. So rather than having a tension test where you're running at a fixed rate until the specimen breaks, test profiler allows you to create various ramps or cyclic steps or hold steps sequentially um, to have a more complex test routine. And so uh, we've added a, a new step type that allows you to move the stage in a part of these methods um, in case you need to do so. And I, and I believe Meredith in, in the demo will be um, talking a little bit more about this, making a little bit, painting a little bit more of a clearer picture for you guys. And then the last thing on this, this list touches our, our test results. So two different things, we, we have actual, reference locations that you can tie to results. So you can see on the screen that if you're creating a grid or you're, cre you're creating a sequence that we just assign 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 15. But maybe those actually tie to particular parts. Of, they're likely tied to a particular part of your component. So say a keyboard, maybe it's uh, A, A, S, D, F, G, just I'm, as I'm looking at my keyboard myself. It could tie to a particular part of the component that you want to, that's just easier to understand what the result is and what it's tied to. So um, we allow that reference, that link to be made. Um, and then we also have a, a couple, we've introduced two, two calculations uh, in the past year or so um, called button and switch. And so historically trying to identify the, the load deflection profile of buttons and of switches can be quite complex and not reliable if you're using um, just our, our, our previous uh, standard calculations. So, so we developed specific calculations designed to characterize 
um, when a button or a switch is being uh, is being pressed. So switching gears. Um, so then our, sec our second feature that we're going to be discussing today is auto positioning. Um, and so what really is auto positioning? It, auto positioning is, is automatic, precise positioning of the crosshead when you're setting up a test. Um, and so why, why do we wanna do this? It really just is a simple way to ensure that test after test, whoever the operator is, that you can have a consistent setup of the fixtures that are required for that method. So you can see in the, the, the short little video here that maybe, maybe we're testing plastics with some side action grips, that there is a defined grip separation that is required at the start of these tests. So say it's 115 millimeters, that's typically the standard for a, a kind of a, a typical size plastic specimen that historically operators are relied upon to set that 115 millimeters, that they are installing their grips and they're manually jogging so that the distance between the upper and the lower jaw face is 115 millimeters. Um, and so depending on who is actually doing this, how careful they're being, that it could be 115, it could be 116, it could be, it's very easy to make, uh, to be a couple millimeters off, um, and that, if you're not setting the same exact distance test after test, you should expect um, a little bit of a difference in, in your results. Um, and then this, sometimes uh, we have when you, know, you might have uh, different mechanisms, different procedures in place to try to help your operators that maybe you actually use tape physically putting tape on the side of the column of, of the frame to say, for this type of test, make sure you stop here. And the operators try to line up the piece of tape with the crosshead. And maybe you have four or five different pieces of tape, depending on the method, that's really not an ideal solution. And so this is just uh, a way of addressing that uh, where the system can automatically do it for you. And, and how is it done? We'll get a little bit more into that, but essentially you're, you're linking any given test method to the fixtures that are used in that, in that test method. So that when you open it up, uh, it knows exactly where it needs to start the test and the crosshead will move there automatically. Uh, and then a, a quick reminder that this, that auto positioning is a feature uh, that was released with our 6,800 frames last year, and it is exclusive to our 6,800 platform. So if you have existing systems that are not part of, that are not 6,800 frames, that this is not uh, solved by a simple software update, that there is hardware required, uh, and it's only delivered with 6,800 frames. So how, how do operators really interact with this? It's when they're opening up a sample. So when they're starting a sample, uh, they're prompted with this window that you can see on the right-hand side. And there's a few different things going on. Um, the first is that you'll see that there's a, an image and maybe some notes uh, of the correct fixtures. So just, the op just a quick reminder to make sure that you've installed the correct load string. Um, and then just a friendly reminder to make sure you're setting your mechanical limits. Always never can remind uh, operators to do that enough. Uh, and then finally, the initiating the movement that where in the crosshead will, will then go to the, the proper location. Their operators are guided to, to press uh, uh, the correct handset buttons to initiate that movement. And then when you see the, where you see the uh, green check mark, um, that, that's signifying that you're at the correct position and the crosshead will not move. Um, but if the crosshead does have to move, you'll see the, the, how far the crosshead will move and what direction, so up or down, to, to make sure that they're aware of where the frame is about, where the crosshead is about to go. And Meredith will be demoing this in a few minutes. And so how... How does this, how is this set up in, in the background? 
So this is in our, our admin tab of Blue Hill Universal. Um, and we have a new fixtures area in, in the admin tab. And if you are setting up a new configuration, so a new set of fixtures to be used, that what you do is you simply just give that particular set of fixtures, so the load cell and grips that you're using, you give them a name. Uh, then you have a choice to upload the image, and we, of course, recommend doing this. Uh, and then you go through this simple uh, like one or two step wizard to configure a teach point. So it essentially establishes a reference point for Blue Hill to know that, okay, this is exactly how far the fixtures are apart. So that when you define any fixture separation for any given method, it knows exactly where it needs to be. And then you can, you can add notes uh, if, if there are any notes to, to help out the operator as they're running tests. So this screen that you're looking at in admin, they create global fixtures. So when, when you've created a global fixture, it can be used in any method. It can be linked to any method that you're creating. Um, so that's kind of the most common use case. However, if you do uh, have a set of fixtures that you know is, is gonna be specific to uh, a particular method, then you can create and configure uh, a set of fixtures that, that resides in that method alone is not globally available. And so that's it, that's, that's the introduction that I wanted to do ahead of the demo. So at this point, uh, I would like to hand things over to, to Meredith in the Instron studio. Hey everybody, thanks Dan, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, like we talked about, I'm standing here in our Instron demo studio, which we've really worked on developing in the last year and gotten very familiar with um, in order to do these types of virtual demonstrations and webinars uh, when you know we can't all be together in person. So right now I'm standing next to a 68 SC5 system, which is our uh, 6800 uh, single column five kilonewton capacity test machine. Um, installed on this is our XY translation stage, uh, a 100 newton load cell, and then our upper probe here. And uh, as a reminder for anybody who is maybe less familiar with our 6800 platform, um, in my hand is a uh, handset, which is used to control all motion on the system. And this is actually also what we're gonna use as our example test specimen uh, in a minute here. So in the next 20 minutes, we're gonna run through a couple different uh, fixtures and applications that a system like this might be used for and some of the advanced features of Blue Hill Universal that Dan's talked to you guys about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, the Blue Hill Universal screen so you can see really up close what I'm doing over here. So let's share that window. And so hopefully you're now all seeing Blue Hill on the left side of your screen and then my video on the right side. And as a reminder, you can use the toggle that's sort of in between the two windows to adjust how big each one of them looks. Uh, and this is really you know, use this to optimize your view. It's about as close as we can get to, you know, you standing in front of a machine with me here in the studio. So the first thing we're going to look at the state itself up close, just so everybody can get a sense of what we're talking about here. So I'm gonna move a little bit closer. This is our XY stage. Uh, it has two linear actuators moving in the X and Y direction. Um, you'll also notice that there is a base extender here at the bottom, as well as a crosshead extender up here at the top. So these basically just move the center of our load string a little bit further out from the column of the machine and gives us the you know, full range of motion that we want from the stage. So this one can move 150 millimeters in both the X and Y directions. On the system itself, you'll also see the fixture that we're going to use to do some testing today. So like I mentioned, this is another one of our 6800 handsets. And the fixture that's installed on here is 3D printed to exactly match this specific device. Uh, a lot of the fixturing that's used on the XY stage is custom just because many of the components tested are regularly shaped uh, and you need some that you know will, will fit exactly that item. It simply attaches to the stage using uh, two of the mounting holes, and there's four of them on the stage itself. 
So it's pretty easy to adapt uh, to any, you know, custom fixturing that is needed. Um, all right, let's put this back down, get situated. All right, I'll come back a little bit. All right, perfect. So like we talked about, you know, the primary uses of a stage like this are either for increased throughput for testing is uh, as an example, this, you know, grid of springs, which we'll install in the system next, uh, or something like a component uh, like the handset or, you know, maybe a keyboard from an old cell phone, anything like that, uh, where, you know, the buttons are irregularly spaced. And, you know, in order to test all of them in a single test sequence, you're going to have to move the stage around. Um, we're going to go ahead and run this, and then we'll dig a little bit into the method and get behind the scenes a bit more. So I'm just going to insert this right into that 3D printed mount that I showed you. It sits in there really nicely. And the first thing that I actually have to do, so the crosshead, I moved up out of the way in order to, you know, install my fixture. And this is set up with auto positioning. So if I were to go and start my test right now, and I say unlock and start, the system is going to actually remind me that this is not in the correct test position based on how the method has been set up. So this is another way that the operator will interact with auto positioning. Uh, the system will not let you start a test if you are in the incorrect starting position. So I'm going to press unlock and return and the crosshead will move back down to the fixture separation that I have set up, which in this case, as you can see right here, is three millimeters. So this is determining how far above my specimen the probe is going to start at the beginning of my test. So let me put on my safety glasses and we'll go ahead and say unlock and start. So I've set up a sequence uh, where this is going to go through and test five of the buttons on the handset. And You'll notice I press the start button once, it runs a single specimen, which in this case is one of the buttons, and then it will automatically create another specimen uh, without me needing to press anything as it goes to test the next button. So each individual test is saved separately. They're just run in sequence uh, and all saved within the same sample file. Another point here is you'll notice that the crosshead moves down to come into contact with the button and is inducing a very small preload. So with the XY stage, we typically recommend this because you need to make sure that your upper probe or whatever you're using to compress your specimen has enough room to clear the, uh, the component that it is actually running a test on. I need to make sure that there's enough space that the probe isn't going to hit something on the device and induce a side load on the load cell uh, or damage the specimen that I'm testing. So this is just something that we typically recommend uh, for a test setup like this. I think in this case, it was um, like half a Newton, just basically to identify when the probe came into contact with the button, at which point it would then uh, start actually recording our test data. So there's a few different ways that this was set up within Blue Hill. And Dan previewed some of this, and now we'll show you a little bit more closely. So the first thing is within this system details tab and then system settings, I can open up our XY stage panel here. So in the same way that I use, you know, the handset to jog the crosshead up and down and, you know, the Z direction, if you will, this is essentially where I can jog the stage. So I can move it forward, move it backwards, add a diagonal, which is kind of nice. Um, and this is really helpful, especially for something like this, where the buttons are not set up in any sort of regular pattern. And I need to identify what coordinates do I need to enter at, in a sequence in order to make sure that the probe is directly centered over the button. So as I'm setting this up, I'm going to jog it and take a look and go, okay, that looks like it's directly centered over for my start button. I'm gonna make a note of whatever that position is. And then I can use that in a sequence uh, when I set that up for this device. Another really great option is, you know, if right here it's reading, you know, 30.97 and minus 24, and I go, okay, why don't I instead, I'm gonna adjust that and say, let's call this 31 and let's call this, you know, 24 say, and I'm gonna say move to that position. Oh, that was minus 24. There we go. Move to position. 
and it'll just adjust it. And I go, okay, yep, that looks good. And this is another way that you can play with positioning the stage, setting up your method, identifying where the probe needs to be in order to uh, come into contact appropriately with that button. I also have the option here to just move back to my zero position. And alternatively, if I decided, you know, I want my zero position to be directly above the first button that I'm testing, I can adjust the stage and go, okay, yeah, that looks pretty good and set that as my zero instead. And I can then set up my whole method to be relative to that zero starting position. So this panel is really where you get to do all of your fine adjustments and uh, really any of the control and movement that's associated with the stage itself in the setup phase of the test. The other place that this is then all integrated is within your method under test control. Most of this will look identical to the way it does in a normal test method, where you can set up your testing parameters, your preload, regular test, uh, test control, end of test, et cetera. But the new piece here is the XY stage tab. And this is where you set up the sequences, which determine you know, the, the, the order and the location of the points it's gonna go run a test at. So this is where, like we talked about, I identified what location uh, the probe needs to be at to press this first button. If I need to add a point to a sequence here, um, this is where I would type it in. So there's, backtracking a little bit, there's three different types of sequences and Dan went over this briefly, but I'll show you what this looks like. So the first one is a grid. So if I wanna add my grid, this pops up a panel where I can then put in sort of all of the parameters that are necessary in order to set up a defined grid of test points. So I can set up the number of rows, columns, and the delta between them and where my starting position is. So if you have something, again, like this um, array of springs that we'll look at in a little bit where everything is equally spaced, I know what that set distance is, this is a huge time saver in setting up your sequence of points instead of manually putting in every single one of them. And if, for example, you know, I set up my test, my grid of springs, and then I go, actually, I need to adjust two of them, or I only want to test, you know, all of them except for a handful, I can convert this into a custom sequence. And it'll then give me all the individual coordinates, and I could go in and change any of them if that was necessary. The other option for adding a sequence is a diamond. So similarly, this gives me all of the parameters that are necessary, and the system will generate uh, my points according to where my home position is and the delta between uh, the you know different points on that sequence. The final option that we looked at already a little bit is this custom sequence. So this is the first one I've set up where this has all of the buttons on the handset. And I went through and identified what location I needed to put in for each of these. And then I entered them um, on this screen here. The other nice options that are available when you look at each point individually is that you can name your points. So especially in this case where, you know, the points are easily identifiable by, oh, it's the jog up button, jog down button, it's my start button, anything like that, um, I can go in and label it. So it's really clear every single time that I'm testing it, which button it's looking at. The other thing that you can change on this screen is the move type. So my options here are absolute or relative, or I can set the home position. So it, if I want to set up all of my coordinates, you know, relative to whatever I've set zero at and use an absolute coordinate system, I can do that. Or if I know that, you know, two of my buttons are spaced five millimeters apart, for example, I can just say, I'd rather move, you know, set this up to say, move five millimeters in the Y direction uh, instead of needing to know what those absolute coordinates are. So there's a lot of flexibility here, and it's uh, it's really helpful to be able to manipulate things on this screen. If I need to switch the order of things, for example, and I've already put in my points, I can move this down, and it simply switched the order in which it'll move to those two points. And it actually gives you a little preview on the bottom here and shows you where the stage is going to be moving in order to test each of those different points. The last piece of this that uh, Dan touched on also is that we can import a, uh, C a CSV file into a custom sequence. So I think, which one did I already convert? Okay, great. So this is my 
um, custom sequence that I converted from a grid. Um, and, you know, theoretically, if I were instead to say import and I went to my handset points that I've already saved, I can say open. And now it's actually added all of those points to the sequence that I, did or, that I had already started. And you can see it says soft key return. And these coordinates are exactly the same as the ones that we looked at here in handset um, because I just simply exported this and then imported it back. And as long as your file is set up um, with all of these columns, basically, so you have a name, move type, X and Y coordinates, you can uh, import that directly into Blue Hill, which is a really helpful feature here. Um, the rest of the test method looks pretty similar to exactly you run a single test. Uh, the only other piece that is a little bit different is on this start test screen, uh, where usually there's you won't see this panel that says run a sequence of tests. This is where I can select which sequence I want to run. So this is really great because you know the test method isn't going to change. If I know that what I, all I want to do is I want to run at 50 millimeters per minute and compress to, in this case, I set 2.5 millimeters of compressive displacement, but I might want to run that on different combinations of buttons uh, or potentially another device has the same test parameters. I don't have to change anything except to go in and say, pick a different sequence. And it'll then run the exact same test method, but on whatever sequence of points I have selected. The, uh, another thing that Dan touched on that we can look at a little bit more closely is this button calculation. So again, this is, specific to the XY stage, um, or I'm sorry, this is specific to uh, testing mostly electronics components, um, often seen in Test Profiler. Uh, but in this case, it basically has a lot of parameters where you can tweak the algorithm that it uses to identify when a button has been pressed and when a button has been released. So you can see on our test screen, that these two black marks where it's um, identifying it on the graph are what it's picking up as your operating force and then your return force. And, you know, I could go in and create a calculation another way where I could try to identify that peak in that valley. But as you can see here, I mean, they're happening between different compressive displacements on my test. It's not the maximum value because the test goes to a higher force um, before it it maxes out its displacement. So, you know, manipulating a calculation to find that exact moment is a little bit more challenging without this calculation that does it for you. And there is a lot of ways to tweak the parameters in case it's not correctly identifying that peak in that valley. Something that's important to think about in something like this is your data rate. The first time I was actually running this um, and, and playing around with this method, I found that it wasn't picking up some of the uh, the operating force and return force for these buttons. And it turned out that it, the data rate wasn't high enough. It wasn't picking up. There wasn't enough information in that region of the test for it to know where the peak was and where the valley was. And as soon as we increased the data rate, the calculation worked perfectly. So something to keep in mind, uh, depending on what you're testing and, you know, a way to troubleshoot if the method isn't initially working the way you would expect it to. The last piece in the method that I wanted to highlight, um, touching back on what Dan showed you earlier, is auto positioning. So we saw how when I opened the method or when I went to start my test and it wasn't in the correct position, I had to say unlock and return to move to the correct auto position starting position. The reason that the method does that is because I have turned on auto positioning in my method and I have told it I want to use the XY stage 6800 handset fixture that I have that I have already set up on this system. And this is set up on a global level, meaning I could access this from any method that I create on this machine. So you'll also see in the drop down that I have this XY stage springs method, which is what I'll use when we switch over the fixtures. And there's also this option for default fixture. So if I knew that only ever going to test this setup with this specific test method, instead of setting it up in admin where I can then access it from other test methods, I can set it up to say 
save only within this one specific method as my default fixture and it'll leave it then locally and I cannot access it if I were to open up a different test method. So those are the differences in sort of the, the two ways that we can set up fixture profiles. Um, and this is the pane in which you would go in and select that. Um, okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is switch over to the grid of springs that I've touched on a couple of times. So Dan's gonna talk to a couple of quick things in the software uh, while I switch things out for you. All right. So yeah, well, I think everyone can hear me. Um, so if you're, if we're looking at Blue Hill Universal, just while Maris is changing some things, um, a couple of things to, to note. So you can see that we're looking at the workspace right now. So we see graph one, we see results one. Um, these are customizable. You can have multiple graphs if need be. You can have multiple results tables if they serve different purposes. Um, and you need to export different things. Um, and you can see in results one, uh, one of the things that I had referenced that that test location. So Meredith had pointed out that she could label each, each test location in that custom sequence. And this is where we're seeing it um, on the results table itself to, 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 to form that link to make it a little bit more easy to read. Um, if you're running sequential tests, on, on the same button, maybe you don't require just one test, maybe you require three or four or five, 10 different tests on that same device to have uh, a higher sample size, um, try to get a, a realistic statistical average, or maybe try to see what the degradation is over time that you can group, you can group um, on anything in a results table. So if you, this is something that we might have Meredith do later, uh, but you can actually uh, set up a subsample where it's, it looks at any given column. All right, dual tasking, I love it. <laughs> um, and it actually groups each, each of uh, those fields. So if you can see, um, it shows the number of specimens that it looks like the soft key one has been tested three times, and it will just quickly arrange that data so that you can um, compare it against each other, so you can see what was, what how it's maybe performed over over time, or if you want to get some sort of statistical average, you can use those those groupings. Um, another another part of uh, what we're looking at is uh, if you look at the operator inputs. So the operator inputs um, right now, Meredith has it set up to show that fixture separation, um, and then also the given sequence that is actually going to be tested. Um, and that's kind of a, a, a cool thing that you can choose from a drop, drop down menu in a, in a single method. Um, you can choose which sequence you want to test. So maybe uh, you only need to test the, the top two buttons. So you can quickly uh, just select half of the buttons, I guess we have in this case uh, that we did today. But then maybe tomorrow, we need to make sure we're testing all of the buttons. And so we can simply use one method to, to perform both tasks. So you don't need to have, uh, to, you don't have to create two methods, three methods, four methods to do all these different iterations, different sequences that you can define and create a number of different sequences, even for different devices, if you wanted to in a single method, um, and then just select the drop down to drive the, the movement of the stage. Um, awesome. Thanks, Dan. Cool. I am uh, set up with our springs here. So we're going to switch over to the next method. Um, so I'm going to close out of this one for the handset we've been looking at. Come on. Let's, yeah, we'll save that. And then, no, I don't need to save my method. All right. All right. So now I'm open up um, sample file to test this new array of springs that I just installed onto our test system. So I'm gonna open up our spring method, open sample. And this is gonna show you the screen that Dan uh, included on a slide as well. So this is 
what an operator will see they're opening up an auto position method and it gives you all these nice reminders of what exactly the system should look like and what it will be doing so i can see my picture make sure that my fixture installed is all correct um reminder to set my test limits which in this case i've, I've already set and i know they're in a good spot and then so my cross it is where it was for the handset testing right it is not in the right spot to be testing these springs we'd be here all day if i tried to start a test from up here so the system tells me exactly what what is going to happen when i tell it to unlock and return and this is going to bring it to the starting position that i've already set up within the method that i know is appropriate for this testing setup so i'm going to say unlock and return and the cross is going to move into position and open up my method for me and so this i mean this setup screen of the um test workspace looks pretty similar to what we had for the handset um like dan was just going over i have a bunch of options here for a different sequence to run i can run a full tray of springs but again i don't think anyone wants to watch me test you know 64 springs so we're just going to test the four corners of this uh, but again on a different day if i needed to test two rows of springs or eight of the springs or any combination i can have any number of sequences in here uh, and the test method will be ex exactly the same this just dictates which which points on my grid it's going to move to Similarly, I've set my fixture separation and I know that this is a good starting height um, for for these tests. So I'm going to go ahead and press unlock and start. And the first thing it does is move to that. Um, in this case, it's zero zero actually right because I've set my home position to be the corner of this grid. And another nice thing that you'll see on the screen. So uh, this method for this test is set up with test profiler. So in the same way that to test an individual specimen you can either use a single you know regular compression method or you can set up a test profiler method where you have multiple steps within your method um, the same thing is true for testing with the xy stage and a feature that i i think is released in a fairly new version of blue hill universal is this active zone piece so as the system is running the live display with the active zone is telling me which See which step in my test profiler sequence the system, the, the method is in at that point in time. Uh, so this is incredibly helpful, especially as your method or your troubleshooting a little bit if it stops or it does something unexpected. It's really nice to be able to tell what it thinks it's doing or where it got caught up. So right now I know it's in its ramp state, then it's going to be in a five second hold, and then it'll tell me when it's backing off uh, in the absolute ramp that's going back to zero millimeters of displacement. Another thing that you can see on the screen that's set up a little bit differently from how we were testing the handset is uh, I have this set up with a double Y axis graph. So in this case, I set it up this way because I know that it's gonna hold for five seconds in the middle there. And it's nice to be able to visually see, you know, what that looks like and when that's happening. So I have time set up on my X axis and then I have force and compressive displacement on on my two y axes and it'll plot both of those measurements um, across across time so this is really nice and i mean again it's so it's supposed to be holding it at five millimeters of displacement you can see that it's staining that pretty well um it's also plot my uh, preset points that i've identified so i'm looking at the force at 10 percent of compressive strain and 25% of compressive strain. And so once it gets to those points in the test, uh, it's it's indicating on my graph where that is um, on my test curves. Um, so once this last test is run, we can look a little bit more closely at test profiler. Uh, for the sake of time, we're not gonna go into that too much in depth, but I do want to talk to the uh, feature that Dan mentioned which is a step within test profiler where you can move the stage in the middle of your test fence. So right now, every, every test, you know, it, it, it runs the same test moving in the downward direction, and then it goes to the same crosshead starting position and the stage will move in between each test that's run. There isn't really a way to control, essentially, if you want the crosshead to move in the Z direction while it's running a sequence of tests. So a reason that this might come up is if I were to test something like this, which is a, looks like a car, an old car radio, 
Um, and still the volume knob is much higher than everything else on this device. So there's sort of two ways to do this, right? Either I can make sure that my probe goes to a height that would clear this button every single time. But then you have you know, half an inch of travel that it needs to get through just to apply a preload. And this would really slow down testing. So the option that I have with Intest Profiler, uh, and I'm gonna open up a new method for this because I have data saved in here already and it's not gonna let me edit my test profiler method. So if I go ahead and open up a new sample file, but using this method that we've already started, um, we'll be able to see that there's a block and we're gonna skip this. Let's see, in my test tab here. So this is the exact method we were just using where it ramps to five millimeters of displacement, it holds for five seconds, and then it's gonna back off. But now I have the option of adding another step. And these are the, the steps that we are, are always offered in Test Profiler where you can hold ramp, cyclic, uh, or zero displacement or gauge length. And then um, this step is the one that is new. So this is move stage. So I can say, you know, within my sequence, at a point in the sequence, uh, you know, move the stage from, you know, whatever it is, point, point A to point B. But the beauty of it is that I can say, you know, move to point A, then absolute ramp back to zero displacement, and then move to another point, and then I can move back down. So in order to kind of jump something like this, that is higher than everything else on your testing specimen, uh, this is really the only way that you can achieve that in order to run, you know, press one button and run a single test that'll test a device that's like this. So, you know, we've gone through a lot of different options here and there's a lot of flexibility within the method and within your fixturing and, and what you can test on something like this. In combination with a lot of our other advanced features for Blue Hill, uh, there's really, you know, a lot of different uh, permutations of all these different capabilities of the system and can be really, you know, effective for testing more complex devices or simply to improve your uh, testing throughput. So with the last few minutes here, I think we've got a bunch of questions uh, that Dan's going to Dan's gonna manage and we may do some more uh, demoing in the software real quick, but thanks everybody. Hi. All right, I'm back. Um, so we have we have five minutes. Um, so there have been a couple of questions coming in, a couple that came in prior to the session actually starting. So um, I'm gonna try to do my best getting to a couple of them and then anything that I don't answer, I'll certainly will be reaching out to you uh, after the webinar itself. Um, so uh, one, one question uh, came in was, in regards to kind of changing from using the XY stage in, in the way that we've shown today to just switching back to just standard uh, axial testing. Um, do you have to actually uninstall the, the stage itself? Um, so you can uninstall the, the stage, but that's not really our re recommended approach. Um, that we do offer adapters where you can mount directly to the top of, of the stage to then um, have the standard Instron clevis adapters, or maybe a type O or a type D, if you're familiar, um, to then mount any sort of grips to to then continue testing uh, without having to remove that stage. Um, so you do retain just that two kilonewton capacity, um, but that can be sufficient for many applications. Um, another one. That Meredith, I think it would be helpful if you could just quickly show there was a question that came in about adding um, a calculation, but specifically um, they're trying to calculate the, the mean value. So if, if in Blue Hill, you can show uh, within a method, so within results, how to, to uh, expose the, the statistics. Yeah, definitely. Something? Yeah. No problem. Um, so the way we would set this up is uh, within my workspace results, 
this is where I've added any of the results that I want to see in this results one panel at the bottom of my uh, workspace here on the test screen. So going back into the method workspace results one you see columns and then statistics. So this is where I've added the results that I'm interested in seeing. But as soon as I go in st into statistics, this is where I can then select any uh, you know statistics I want to show for those results. So we're looking at the mean. So I can go ahead and say, add the mean. And then when I go back to my test screen, you'll see it, this file doesn't have any uh, test results saved in it. So it's not obviously calculating anything right now. But as soon as I have results in here, the mean will uh, automatically get calculated for you. And one other nice thing here is um, I can also go into this uh, format tab and oh, my screen's blocking it. But at the bottom here where it says show excluded results, show results, show group statistics and sample statistics. So do you remember when uh, Dan was talking earlier about how we can group results by their uh, XY test location? So if I wanted to group all of the results from one button that I tested, you can say, instead of showing my sample statistics, I can just show the group statistics if I only care about the average on that individual button that was tested three times or something. So uh, there's a couple options here, but yeah, it's super straightforward to add. Um, and there's a bunch of other uh, options for adding statistics as well. All right, awesome. That was a perfect explanation. Um, another, another, uh, question, I guess we try to get to, to one, one more. Um, and so there was a question about uh, how we've, we've been showing photos and the, the demo itself was on a, a single column frame. So it's uh, just, uh, and the question is that they have a, a dual column system and, and if the stage can be installed on a dual column in strong frame. Um, so the answer to that is yes. Again, the, the stage itself is compatible with 59 and 6800 controllers. Um, so if you do have a dual column system, that we do have those columns there. So depending on the amount of travel that your stage requires, you might need to get an extra wide version. Um, but if you are using the smaller travel stage, that we can mount that uh, to a traditional dual column in strong frame. Um, so even though we saw that the, the shorter version, or sorry, the single column today, uh, two dual columns are compatible. Uh, and so I think we're running low on time. So respect, uh, with, with respect to everyone's time, I wanna hand it back over to, to Nick to close things out. All right, and I'm back. Uh, thank you both. Great presentation here today. Before we wrap things up, I just have a few quick notes. Uh, first, uh, any questions that we didn't address live, we'll be sure to follow up by uh, email to those individuals. Um, and then we'll also be emailing everyone a copy of today's recording along with the slide deck. And last thing I wanna mention is about a webinar we have coming up next week. It's a, a guide to composites fracture toughness in sandwich construction testing. Uh, it's scheduled for Thursday, September 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'm going to drop a link to uh, the registration page in a chat so everyone that's interested can register. And then um, that's, that's pretty much all we have today. With that said, I just want to say thanks again to Dan and Meredith for presenting today. Uh, and thanks to all of you for attending. We do really appreciate you joining us today. Stay healthy, everyone. We hope to see you again next time.